Hi, saints of God. It's wonderful to, to be here again and uh, just to share the word with you precious people that we miss so very much. Um, miss every single student. I could actually name you all by name, but obviously missing just every single one. Just know that from the bottom of my heart. I pray and trust that you are doing good and that you are well and um, that you are once again joining me for this, this awesome lesson as we continue the chronological teaching through the word. Um, today I'm doing lesson 15 and uh, yes, where God chose Abram and guided him to Canaan. And the second part of the lesson will then be God chose the fertile plains of Sodom. Um, sorry, Lot chose the fertile plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. So yes, let us pray, pray as we start this morning. Father, we thank you in the precious name of Jesus Christ that you are the great I am in every situation of our lives, in our choices, in the things we do, the things we say, that if we trust in you, you are truly, truly the one that guides and leads our steps. And this is a, 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 a lesson about that very thing, about choices, about leading and guiding us. And so my prayer today, Father, is that every single one that would hear my voice today or watch me on the net, Father, that you would guide and lead every single one of these steps, that they would call to you, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, that they would trust in you, and that, Father God, as we walk this journey and this road, we know that if we trust you, Lord, we believe in you, that we will never walk it alone. So we thank you today for this precious time as we break open your word that brings forth life, and we pray it in the name of our Lord and Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, yes, this is wonderful. We are back again studying the word and um, just incredible. This is not just stories. It's amazing truths that teach us so many things. So if we look back to see where we were last week and what we, we touched on, and we remember that, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the whole lesson was about how God remembered Noah and all uh, that was in the ark. And then the second portion was how they all of a sudden built a, a, the Tower of Babel, and then God actually scattered the rebels at the Tower of Babel, those people that wanted to make a big name for themselves. So today we'll, we'll, we'll have a look and continue, um, you know, with, this, with, with the word. But before I do, I just want to ask if you recall, and I want you to remember, how did the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth know about God? Now, it's an interesting thing that the word says, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I want to bring something to your attention that I, as I was studying, you know, a, a while ago, um, and, and I've been sort of meaning to say, the word actually says Shem, Ham, and Japheth because Shem is the line through whom God is working. But actually, it was actually Japheth, then Shem, then Ham. Shem was actually the middle, the, the one that was born in the middle. Just a little sort for nothing. <laughs> okay, so the reason why the, 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 these guys, the descendants, knew um, exactly about God from uh, the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth is because he created everything around them that showed them that there is a God, that the creator is all powerful. Also, because they'd heard the stories along the way, you know, the stories that their ancestors had taught them, and especially the stories about, about the, uh, uh, the flood and how God punishes sin. Also, because they'd seen the rainbow, which they had been passed on through generations, that the rainbow was God's sign, a promise to remind them that God always keeps his promises and that never again would he wipe out the whole earth with the flood. With the flood. And remember I said, just for those that would question, God did not say that the floods would not come. We've seen floods, but he said he would not wipe the whole earth. And we trust and we believe because God is a God that keeps his promises. And also because of the way that, uh, um, that to approach God was obviously according to what he had told them um, through their ancestors. There's only one way. So right, let's carry on and we read today uh, uh, about the story of, of, of um, uh, not only how the, 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 the way it went from the descendants, how eventually we see God, uh, you know, this whole story enveloping and how exciting it gets. So what did the descendants uh, 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 worship at that time, um, you know, instead of God? 
Well, we catch, remember I said to you, the crocodile, I said, oh my word. You see, that's the only thing that some eventually had been told because the generations had passed through things. And what did they worship? They worshiped the images of people and animals and birds and reptiles, as well as the sun, moon and stars. I mean, really, you know, um, they, this is what the kiddies knew. This is what the people knew. This is what they grew up knowing because they had not been led in the ways of God. And so anything that you get taught when you are little, that's what you're going to believe when you get big. You know, if I said to you that my book is round, you're going to believe the book is round. Uh, you're not going to believe that it is square or oblong or rectangular. You're going to believe that it's round. So that's what they knew. They knew to worship these idols because their ancestors had not kept, um, you know, trusting in God and believing. They'd moved away from God. And what instructions did God give Noah then to his sons? that he'd also given to Adam. Wow, well, he said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. What did they do at the Tower of Babel? We see that instead of that, they wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to exalt themselves. And they wanted to bring everyone into a, a, a one place where they could actually, these great big men and mighty leaders would actually be the ones that would be controlling the whole lot of them. And so what did God do to stop these people? Well, he made a big mix-up, a big mix-up. And we see that he caused extended families groups to actually eventually speak in different languages as he scattered them, and they could no longer understand each other, one another. So, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, I just want to touch on something amazing that we're going to look at this. So after the account of the flood, all right, and we see that, because of the descendants uh, of Shem, Ham, and Japheth not uh, uh, believing in God, not trusting in God, not, not listening to God's ways, um, we see that man still struggled to trust. Man struggled to trust and still pursued his own interests, right? In fact, as I said, making a name for himself. Anything new? What is new today? Man is still trying to make a, a name for themselves. When we go into a job situation, it's not good enough to do this or God, not good enough to just be that. We want to always elevate, elevate, exalt, exalt ourselves. We want the big name. We want to be the big deal of the day, isn't it? We want to be the, we're not happy with our small jobs. And I'm not saying that it's not good to, to go up in, in, in a company and to better yourself. I'm not saying that. Um, I'm just saying that if it comes with the right attitude, but yet man has been driven through the years and through time to actually do his own thing and to always better himself, to make a name for himself. And But this many times is, you know, when you're not walking with God, you're not walking in godly ways, it actually truly is, it's all about selfish ambition, the ambition of man, the desire of, of man, the greed, you know. So at this time of the lesson, Okay, we saw that through the Tower of Babel. But at this time of the lesson, we actually come to a place where we, 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 we get introduced to a man, a man from Shem's line, who actually shows us that we can trust in God. He shows us um, that, that, that we can believe in what God says. And a man who instead of building his own tower and instead of building um, this tower to, to, and, and this big thing to honor his own name, what he did was he built an altar instead of to honor himself. He built an altar to honor the great I am, Yahweh Elohim, the creator of heaven and earth. In fact, the creator of all mankind. And so we look at this and we see that we now turn our focus onto this lesson because God does not want us to drift through life just merely just plodding along, okay? So in chapter 10, we see, because our lesson starts off at chapter 11, um, and, and in chapter 10, we see that it starts off with, the, with Shem's line, a very interesting fact, my friends, Shem's line. And then right after the, then, then we've got the Tower of Babel. And then right after the Tower of Babel, it goes straight back, the end of the chapter 10, in which we see each of Noah's sons. And we have, uh, you know, by then we, we see that we have a reading of how they find their own places and uh, their own languages. And it's just amazing that the Torah Babel comes in between there. But one, if one skips from that, from chapter 10, to the end of chapter 10, the Tower of Babel was just, by the way, let me just show you what happens when people don't trust God. 
And then we see that all of a sudden we come to where we are today. And we're going to read some of chapter 11. So he tells us that, uh, God tells us that in his word, the Holy Bible is where he gives us direction. Why? Because God is the only one, my friend, that knows the future. He knows the future and he can steer you and I in the right direction. He knew he was going to bring a flood. So he said, Noah, tell the people, tell the people to trust me, tell the people to believe in me, tell the people to forsake all their old things and all their things that they desire and to follow me. But they wouldn't. So he brought the flood and continuously may God will give us a way out if we trust. But many a day, many a time, many a people will say it's not God. I was just reading something interesting. I'm actually watching something that somebody sent me, how in today's life, oh my friends, my students, believers, today's life where people say the Bible is just a, a, a bunch of stories. It's just theories. It's just uh, complete nonsense. It's absolute, uh, absolute rubbish. Forgive me for the word. Um, some would say that there's no such a thing as God. You know, there's a higher power, but who can we say, etc. And so there's nothing new under the sun. But God is always knocking at the door of our hearts, eh? And he knocked at the door of all those people's hearts. And still today, he's knocking at, our, at, at the door of our hearts. So the consequences of choosing to reject God's word will actually truly affect our lives. In fact, the repercussion of that would, will actually be like the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And, um, but, but yet we can see that the way we choose, you know, will actually affect us for eternity. Why? Because it's appointed to all men that one day they will die. One day they will stand before the great I am and have a judgment set before them. And so even the decisions we make today, friends, it actually affects our loved ones and, 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 and their attitudes and their attitudes towards God and their attitudes towards the Bible. And this is why it's wise to listen to sound doctrine, sound instruction and believe what God says. We are going to learn about this man that I said earlier that is, you know, who paid attention to what God said to him. This man that even though through circumstances could, uh, they could have influenced him, could have influenced him to actually make the wrong choices, my friend. Could have influenced him. What about us? What about your choices and mine that we do today and moving forward so much so, isn't it? So this man that I spoke about earlier on, that came through the line of Shem, uh, the, the, the bloodline of Shem and, and, and did not, you know, build a tower for himself, but honored God. This man, Abram. Abram was a descendant of Shem. And we are going to study about this, this, about, uh, 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 this man in this lesson. So, you know, he was the son of Terah. Terah, who was a descendant of Noah's son, Shem. So we see how he comes down the bloodline. But remember, we're going to see something interesting about, about Terah as well. Well, later on, uh, you know, we, we will learn that God changed Abram's name and Sarai, his wife's name, um, to Abraham, Abraham and Sarah. And, uh, but that's for a little later. So um, we see that, yeah, um, uh, let's read Genesis 11, verse 27 uh, and to 30. I don't want to sort of jump uh, over, you know, ahead of myself. Because we see that Abram, Abram marries Sarai. And so from verse 27 to 30, it says that now this is the history of the descendants of Terah. Terah was the father of Abraham, um, of Abram, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. Okay. Haran died before his father Terah died. So he died early in the early years. In the land of his birth, in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. Milcah, Milcah the daughter of Haran and the father of Milcah and Ishka. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And I'm going to stop there for a while and we're going to continue this lesson. So we see that Abram and Sarai remained child childless. Now, we, we see that obviously Saran was Sarai was barren. And in those days, friend, being childless, childless was considered a huge disgrace. In fact, women fought for their husband's attention 
to get, um, especially when there were more than one wife, to actually give them a child they so desperately wanted and needed. So we carry on reading, and we see that in verse 31 it says, And Terah, uh, the, uh, the father, took Abram his son, Lot, and the son of Aran. Remember the, uh, uh, Terah, Terah's son, Haran? He had died. So Terah took Abram and, his, uh, 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 the, and Lot, the son of Aran, his grandson, and Sarai, his, grand, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth together to go from Ur to the Chaldeans into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Aran, they settled there. And Terah lived 205 years, and then Terah died in Haran. Well, we see here that Ur, which is near the, uh, to the place where many years earlier, the rebellious descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth had started to, instruct, uh, to construct the Tower of Babel. And we see the ruins of Ur um, that are present in Iraq, today's present-day Iraq. We see it today. We see those ruins of Ur that are there. And so we see in verse 31 where Abram, uh, uh, his father Terah, along with Abram and Sarah, they leave Ur and now they move to Haran. Remember, Haran was actually one of his son's names. So Terah also took with him. Remember, Terah took with him his grandson, Lot, and um, whose father, Haran, had died in Ur. So now we see Sarah, Artera, took Lot, okay? And uh, because he had obviously Lot and his son. So they intended to actually go into Canaan originally, but, but only got to as far as Haran, where then eventually Terah died. So we read in Genesis 12, verse 1, it says, Now in Aran... The Lord said to Abram, go for yourself, for your own advantage, in other words, for your own good, away from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house to the land that I will show you. This is God speaking. So let me stop there, otherwise I'll run ahead of myself again. So before Abram and his father moved to Aran, God had made himself known to Abram, to Abram. We see here that um, in Acts 7, verse 2 to 3, um, it says the glory of God appeared. God, the God of glory appeared um, to Abram and when he was in Mesopotamia and, and before he dwelt in Aran. So before he came to Aran and said to him, get out of your country, from, out of your, for, away from your relatives to the land I'm going to show you, which obviously confirms the, this chapter in uh, 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 to, uh, Hebrews 12, verse 1. And then we see here that, uh, remember, the Bible was not written in, in Abram's time. And so, um, yet he had l heard the voice of God. So, considering that the Bible is not written in Abram's time, well, God spoke to him directly, okay? And of course, we see that God today still speaks to us, but primarily communicating to his people today through his word, through the written word. Now, Abram was very different from the people in his land. And um, even though he was born a pagan, because we know that they worshipped idols. In fact, his father had been a, an idolater. And remember, they'd come down through the, the line of Shem, Ham and Japheth. But through the line of Shem, they all worshipped idols. Those descendants all worshipped idols, sun and moon. And, 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 and Terah was a, a sun and moon worshipper. So we see here that... Um, because they'd served other gods, but yet Abram was different. And although Abram was raised amongst these idolatrous people, you know, he, he looked at God in a different way. He responded to God in a different way, and God revealed himself to Abram. And so, although he was a descendant of, uh, 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 um, of Adam, of Adam, of a a a Adam he, he, he was a sinner. He too was a sinner, remember? And so he, but, but, you know, because he had come down through those bloodlines that had not worshipped God, but also because he was a sinner through Adam's sin, Adam and Eve's sin. Uh, we are all born sinners because we are all uh, connected way back to Abram and way back to Adam. And so we see that uh, um, uh, because uh, um, Abram believed in God and in God's promises, then obviously God came to him and, and revealed himself to him by speaking to him directly. And um, so we see that God commanded Abram to leave his country and his people. And why? Why did God say that? 
Well, God's plans for, Ab- for Abram would not have been achieved while he was still living amongst the idolatrous people, amongst those countrymen that all they did was worship false gods. And so Abram had to leave his homeland. He had to take his family. He had to leave his country. And he had to go where God was promising him that God would guide him. And um, so, of course, God had the right to say, Abram, just leave this place. It's not good for you, my friend. You know what? Just go to where I'm telling you because that's where I'm going to provide for you. And so God is almighty. He's all wise. He's a sovereign creator. He knows your beginning better than you know your end. But he knows your beginning and your end. And so um, God knows uh, because he is the one that gives life and gives life to all. And he knows our everything and our every move and our every thought and our every deed and our every ambition and our every desire and our every thought, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, attitude, you know. And so God knows. And he knew that Abram needed to move out of there. Otherwise, he was not going to achieve what God wanted him to achieve because he would have too much of the idolatrous ways around him. And so we see that Abram was to play an important, important role, an important God in God's plan to send the deliverer. You remember what this promised one would be, would do? Remember, right in the beginning of, of the studies, it, we, we, we said that, you know, uh, and, and the word says right from the beginning, he would overcome Satan. He would overcome Satan. This deliverer would overcome Satan and deliver the world from its powers and from Satan's powers and demonic ways, and that he, this deliverer, would make it possible for the people to bring, be brought back to God and um, to be in oneness with God Almighty, the great I Am. So in spite of man's instant rebellion, we see that God never abandoned his plan, not from the beginning of time, not ever, so that he would send the deliverer. Now, we consider the fact that the descendants of Ham, Sham, and Japheth you know, they were building this Tower of Babel. Um, they deliberately turned away from him and the truth. Um, in fact, why did they worship uh, uh, all these other things except wanting to worship the Creator? Because they, they, were, they were wicked people, as we said. They went away from God. And God wanted him to worship them. Why? Because he was the one that created man. He's the one that's created all things. So moving right along, friend. Yes, So even during all this time when they rebelled against God, God still loved them. God still loves you and me. God still loves mankind. And he intended to fulfill his promise to send the deliverer no matter what. Why? Because God has never given up on man. And God is not man that he should lie. And God keeps his promises. Because the word says to us, his promises are yes and amen. So choosing Abram was the next step to God's plan to rescue man from Satan's control. And God's plans will always succeed, my friend. Nothing can stop God from carrying out those plans. In fact, listen to what God says in Isaiah 46, 9 to 10. It says, I am the God. I am God, sorry, I am God, and there is no other God. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So in other words, whatever pleases God to do, he will do because he can. He formed the world out of nothing. The word in Hebrew says bara. It means that he made something out of nothing. I can't stand here and go poof, and there's something out of nothing. You and I can never do that. No one in this world can do that. But God formed the earth out of nothing, and he created the earth and the heavens and all these things What an amazing God, great and mighty God that he is. So whatever God promises to do, as I said just now, he completes. You know, in fact, he even says that in Philippians 1 verse 6, that the good work that he has started in you, the good work he's begun in you, he's faithful and just to complete that work. We always have sung that song. He who began a good work in you, he's faithful to complete it. He is faithful to complete it. He is faithful to complete the work he started in you. Then that is the truth. Okay, never mind my voice. I just wanted to sing it over you because he's 
faithful, how God is faithful. Hallelujah. And we are excited about what God is doing. So we read right along. Genesis 12, verse 2 to 3. It says, and I will make you. Now, remember, he just said he must leave his, 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 his country and all the relatives and your father's house. It says, and I will make of you, verse 2, a great nation. And I will bless you with abundant increase of favors. That's in my Amplified Bible, by the way. And make your name famous and distinguished. And you will be a blessing, dispensing good to others. And verse 3 says, I will bless those who bless you. Very important. Who confer prosperity or happiness upon you. And curse him who curses or uses insolent language towards you. In you will all the families and kindreds of the earth be blessed. And by you, they will bless themselves. So we see here, we see Abram's faith and obedience. Please God. Amen. Please God, my friends. So uh, we say, Lord, let my heart, my attitudes, my walk, the things I do, the things I say, my actions, let them please you, Lord. My choices. Let them please you, Lord. So we see here that according to Genesis 12, verse 2 and 3, that God promises Abraham many things. Let's have a look at these. Okay, so what does God say in the scripture? It says, I will bless you and make you a great nation. Well, that means he will become the father of a great nation. Then he says, God says, I will bless you. You will be a blessing. In other words, God is saying that he would become a man of great importance. It's, it's, the scripture says, I will make your name great. Well, uh, 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 sorry, let me just go right back. I will bless you and make you a great nation. In other words, he's talking about the fact that he will be a father of a great, a great nation. I will bless you and you will be a blessing. In other words, God was promising that he would protect and prosper Abram. Then third point, I will make your name great. In other words, he'd become a man of great importance. The scripture carries on and says, and I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. Well, that means God would prosper those who helped Abram along his journey, but would punish those who actually harmed him. And then the one scripture says they would be, that, that they would be blessed. In other words, they would be blessed through us. They would be, that they, by us, by you, Abram, they would be blessed. In other words, through Abram, through all the families of the earth, then all through him, all the families of the earth would, would receive great spiritual blessing. And in fact, as the word says here in my Amplified, that um, he would confer prosperity and happiness as well. So very interesting that God promised Abraham that here it is, through your bloodline, Abram, the world, the deliverer will come that will bless the world and give them an opportunity to come back to a oneness in God. And this is amazing. So the most important thing he's saying to Abram, actually, when he says, I will bless you and make you a great nation and I will prosper you and I'll make you and I will and I will. God is promising all these things. He's promised God, Abram that through his descendants, through his seed, that the deliverer would come. The most important thing, the most important promise to Abram was found in verse 3, which says that in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. How can it be if eventually Abram died? It's because through the seed the deliverer would come. All the nations will be blessed through this deliverer and through Abram's descendant. And we know as we po it all points to Jesus. Remember right from the beginning of Genesis, every single scripture we read, God is pointing us to Jesus. God is pointing us to the deliverer. God is pointing us to the one that would come and pay the ultimate penalty for sin so that you and I can come back and have oneness with God and be brought back to, to relationship with God Almighty. So we see that when God promised Abram that one of his descendants would be the deliverer, it actually seemed impossible, isn't it? I mean, why would this have been impossible to Abram? Because to be honest with you, not only because it was thousands of years before or whatever, he didn't know that. It's because actually Sarai had never been able to have children. Remember, we read how she was barren, okay? So in spite of all this, 
Abram still believed in God. Isn't that awesome? You know, in spite of what we see happening, in spite of what happens in our daily lives, we have to trust in the one that is I am in every situation of our lives. And in spite of this, we see that Abram believed in God. So although he didn't understand how God was going to fulfill this promise, well, he believed that this deliverer would come from his family and through his family line. Hey, imagine if God told you and I that. Wow. So Abram's environment and circumstances were not conducive to, to belief. Because we see here that while he, you know, Abram was living in a sinful, idolatrous place, as I said, and then he came from a, the, the family that didn't worship God, um, uh, the one and only true living God. He was surrounded by men and women that actually sc scorned at God. And so how then could this still be happening, that God is promising to bring this deliverer through Abram? We don't even have an excuse today because, to be honest, Abram actually be, uh, be, uh, lived where <clears throat> so many, in fact, those descendants had followed their own evil desires. And, and yet Abram believed. Abram believed. We have no excuse, as I said, because today we have so much of the gospel. We have so much. Many churches, many people proclaiming the gospel, many people saying things about the word and about God, many prophesying. So we don't have an excuse. Amen? So, but yet Abram, he believed in and obeyed God even through all that. And when God told Abram to leave his home, to go to another country, guess what? Abram did, all right? But God told him, not because of my ambition of going to, um, you know, become a better person, become a, be a more clued up person, become a this, that. No, 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 no. It was God told him to leave his country and go to another country. So why did, why did do you think Abram obeyed God? Because he trusted in him. He knew that God had the better for him than what he thought or had. For himself. So we see that Abram went as the Lord had told him. In, 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 in Genesis 12, verse 4 to 5, it actually says that Abram, so Abram departed as the Lord had directed him, and Lot, his nephew, went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Now remember, Terah brought Abram and Lot. Lot was his grandson. He brought him with them when they moved and they wanted to get to the, to, to the promised land. Then we see Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions and all that they gathered and the persons and servants and they'd acquired in Aran and they went forth to go to the land of Canaan where they came to uh, uh, when eventually they would get there. Okay, so let's have a look and read and as we carry on. Okay. So we see here that Abram took his wife, he took everything, he took all his possessions, and he gathered all the people that he'd acquired uh, uh, in, Haran, uh, in Haran, and they set out to the land of Canaan, all right? So now Abram's decision to obey God um, involved other people as well. It involved other people as well. In fact, his household. It involved his household. In fact, it not only just involved him pushing out and going off and leaving everything behind. You know, like sometimes we've heard we some guy will get up and say, well, God's told me to go to the ends of the earth, and uh, so I'm leaving my wife and my kids. No, no. This year, Abram's story is God told him to take his household, and including all his servants. So this involved taking all his servants with him. We also see that in addition, here is somebody, Abram's nephew, that all of a sudden went, his, uh, his name is Lot, as we said, went with Abram and Sarai. Now, Abram and all those who traveled with him, those were people Remember, they lived in tents, so they could pick up their tent and off they went. And, uh, but the Lord faithfully guided Abram uh, to Canaan, the land that he had promised to give him. All right, so moving right along. We see that Abram and Lot, all of a sudden, they, they settled together while um, they owned the land of Canaan. And as they uh, settled, settled together in this land, they were both very wealthy because, remember, through time, they developed their own uh, uh, people. They, uh, they had their own uh, families. They had developed their own uh, uh, servants, etc., etc. So they were both quite wealthy and owned many. They, they'd gotten many cattle, you know. And so we see sheep and goats were their, their part of their belongings. And so we see that they'd, they'd acquired a lot. They, they were wealthy in, even in today's life. If you've got lots of sheep and goats and, and cattle and so on, you are wealthy. Amen? 
So um, Abram and Lot, they were living close together. And uh, yeah, we all of a sudden see that um, uh, the picture starts turning. There isn't enough for both of them. There wasn't sufficient grass for the animals and sufficient water for these animals to drink. And so uh, all of a sudden we see that there must have been, you know, the jitteries moving on and, you know, this is my place and this is mine and this is my cattle. And all of a sudden we see the story unfolding where all of a sudden, because there wasn't enough, it caused disagreements between the servants that were taking care of both um, uh, Abram as herds and Lot's herds, okay? So if we read in Genesis 13, verse 5, um, we carry on and we see, let me just see where my, my, my Bible is, because um, I've lost the one. 13, verse 5, there we go. Well, it says, but Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. So that's telling you that they both had, all right? So they not just Abram, that had gone with his possessions and gathered all his people and taken everything and all his servants. We see that he had taken, you know, that he had herds and tents. And then it says, now the land was not able to nourish and support them so they could dwell together. And for their possessions were too great for them to live together in that one place. So there was strife, listen to that, between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herd, herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling there then in the land, making fodder more difficult to even obtain. So we see here that, you know, to Abram, the man that trusted and believed in God, I think this must have really, uh, 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 was really a problem for him. Because we see that, you know, Disputes should never arise amongst brothers. But yeah, all of a sudden, disputes were coming. And as the word says, that in fact there was strife. Strife amongst them. And that should never, ever happen. And so in order for that to stop, what did Abram do? Very often when there's strife and there's problems amongst brothers and sisters in today's life, amongst families, families just, you know, hate each other, stop talking to each other. But Abram is a wise man and he wanted to do what was right. And so um, he, 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 he was proposing a solution to Lot here and because he was trying to keep the peace, guys. He was trying to keep the peace. And we see later on how he actually does eventually help Lot, but not moving ahead of myself. So the land was not, it would not have been enough for both of them. So what happened, you see? Because to be honest with you, friends, greed always sets in, hey? Greed always comes in some way or other. And uh, so uh, greed comes and, and then it can actually spoil it for everybody. And so we're seeing here that what did Abram do? Abram stepped back. And he had come with a, pro a, a proposal and um, thinking that, he, you know, knowing he has a solution. And so he stepped right back and he gave a, a choice to Lot. <clears throat> we see that Abram, he was a man that truly was not interested in his own rights. Abram was a man that gave Lot the option to choose and was not worried that he was going to be without or have less or whatever. But in, in, in chapter uh, Genesis 13, verse 8 to 9, it says, uh, 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 let me just read what Abram says. So Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife, I beg of you, between you and me or between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are relatives. It is not, is not the whole land before you. Separate yourself, I beg of you, from me. And if you take the left hand, then I will take the right. Or if you choose the right, then I will take the left. Really not an issue to Abram. He just wants to keep the peace. He says, let there not be no strife between you and us, between your herdsmen and mine. You know, let's, let's really sort this problem in peace. Just what we have to think of. Every time we have a problem with anyone, the best thing is forgive, forget, move forward, and let there be no strife among us. Just a quick one for nothing. <laughs> so anyway, so we see here that Abram is giving Lot the opportunity to choose. In, verse 13, in, in chapter 13, verse 10 to 11, look what happens. Here's Abram saying, if you choose the left, I'll take the left, uh, the right. If you choose the right, I'll take the left. Look what happens here. In verse 10, I'm going to read 10 to 11. And Lot looked and saw that everywhere the Jordan Valley 
was well watered. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, it was like all this place, all the likes of God. It looked like the garden of the Lord, like the garden of Eden, like the land and like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. Lot, so then Lot chose for himself all, listen to that, all the Jordan Valley, and he traveled east, and they separated. Wow. Isn't it amazing? It says here, he saw, he saw with the eyes. He saw that this land was well watered. It looked so luscious and wonderful. And what did he do? You know, the word talks to, uh, to, talks to us about the fact that, you know, the lust of the eyes, we must be careful. How many people, how do people today get spoken to about, oh, go and buy that thing. That's better than that because they see it and they want it. And so we see here, and, um, you know, in 1 John 2, um, I think it's verse 15, go and check it, or verse 16. It says, for all, sorry, I, I, I'm just trying to remember, but for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. It's not of God himself. And yet he had seen, Lot had seen this, and through the lust of the eyes, it looked good, it looked awesome, and that's the one he chose. Because Lot, even though, friends, Lot believed and trusted God, just as Abram did. Why? Because he, he had come along with him. He had, he, he had left the land originally with Terah, um, and Abram, so he must have had some, some trust. He trusted in God, of course he did. He, he, he believed in God. But however, he failed to consider a very important thing, that his decision by not looking to God for direction would actually affect him and his whole family. So what does it seem, uh, you know, as though Lot was thinking about when he made this decision? Ah, friends, that he, he wasn't thinking about God. He didn't even take God into, into thought. He just saw, and he thought, that is what I want. And um, I think the, the fact that he wasn't even thinking about God, but thinking about his decision, is because he was thinking how it benefited him, how financially it would benefit him. The cows, the, the cattle would, would, would feed on the good land. The sheep would feed well. Every single thing, the goats would have lots to eat. And this is what he saw, friends. He saw a financial gain, financial benefit. Mm. So through this example, what have we learned you know, about it? Isn't it that it's foolish to ignore God when making decisions and, 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 make, and, and going in your own direction? You know, what, happens, what happened to mankind? What happened to Adam and Eve when they did not listen and they disobeyed God? Well, we saw that there was a complete separation, that in fact all people got separated from God through their mistakes. Okay? What happened to Cain's descendants? Because Cain made foolish decisions to ignore God. Once again, we see that they all drowned in the flood. They didn't want to accept God. They drowned in the flood. So because Lot had failed to consult God and, th and, and thought only of his awesome uh, prosperity and his financial gain, um, terrible things were actually going to happen to him, friends. Terrible things. So we see that we need to be careful of the choices we make, isn't it just? We need to be careful of these choices, you know, because in our society, we continuously see how we are pressurized to make choices. In fact, um, we are pressurized in, 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 um, in, in many things that can actually have a huge, a compounding, a, a profound impact in our lives, a huge I impact in our lives um, and, and, and our attitudes towards God and his word. Um, these things so steer us away from it. So take us away from, from our godly walk and our godly journey. If we look at TV, for example, um, if we look and we see that there are examples that I can say about things that every day through the adv advertising world, what happens? You know, we are told to think for ourselves, for our financial gain, you know, for our financial advancement. Uh, materialism is such a big thing that takes us away from God. It's all I need, I need, I need. No, friend, it's I greed, I greed, I greed. And unfortunately, that is the state of many in the world today. I'm not talking about those places where they have nothing, where they don't even have running water. Oh, dear Lord, we pray that they will have provision, that they will have running water, that they will have more than enough to eat and, and to live. 
Um, but but I'm tra- praying. Uh, I'm speaking about those that live in these huge cities, and and today materialism has taken over. Um, the TV, the advertising world, as I said. So we are told to think for ourselves. In fact, we are st- oh, in every advert. It's about what it's, it's, it's good for you. You see, you need it. You're entitled to it. You, you, you owe it to yourself to get it, isn't it? And all these things are how it can benefit me, me, me. And oh, dear Lord. It all pushes us away from God. Because when man has a lot and they've got everything, they turn around and say, I don't need God in my life. I've got everything. Why would I need God? I've saved myself. And that isn't that what man normally says when they don't want to adhere to God's ways. So we see that how does God use these, these things to actually, you know, um, salt, uh, bring this assault on our minds? Well, we see that he uses it to block out any thought of the real important issues, the real importance of actually trusting God and the real important things that can affect us for eternity, my friends. So if a person chooses to turn away from God and from what God is saying, this person truly will regret it forever, not only in this lifetime, but in the the life that is to come, in other words, for eternity, okay? And it is a sobering thought. The sobering thought to think that those that refuse uh, to, to trust in God and believe in God, those that refuse to obey God, in fact, you know what? They might be okay in this life, so they think, but actually they will spend eternity separated from God in the lake of fire, which God prepares, prepared originally for his Satan, for, for his Satan and his, Satan's demons, for Satan and his demons, not for God's and Satan, for Satan and his demons, because That was God's way of dealing with that. But Satan deceived man, and today many of those that don't want to trust God will obviously, you know, be thrown into that place with him, unfortunately. And so we see that going back to Lot, my friends, God made the wrong choice. Hallelujah. Isn't that terrible? God made, Lot made the wrong choice. God had given them ways, but but Lot made the wrong choice. In Genesis 13, verse 13, it says, Now the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were wicked, and they were great sinners against the Lord. So Abram, who stayed in the rocky places, because remember he said, if you take that side, I'll take this side. Lot took the luscious, green, beautiful valleys with running waters, and Abram, well, he stayed in the rocky sections of the lands and the less fertile mountains and the hills of Canaan. Lot moved right down um, uh, uh, to the well-watered plains and settled near the city of Sodom. I want to stress that to you. So, rock, so Abram, he, cho- he moved and sta- well, he stayed there in the rocky, uh, 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 less fertile mountainous area okay, of the hills of Canaan. Lot moved down to the beautiful valleys, to the beautiful plains, to the well-watered plains. Can you see it? All the luscious green grass moved down there. Well, and settled, I want to use the word, near. Near the city of Sodom. He moved and settled near the city of Sodom. Keep that word in mind as we go along. Um, We'll see when I'll bring that word back into, into the lesson again. So, in the eyes of men, Good people, it would appear that as though Abram now was going to be the loser. But God had said, through your seed, I will bless, I will make you a great nation, I will give you a great name, I will bring the deliverer through your seed. And now we see, wow, it appears that he's the loser, isn't it? Because in this division of territory, well, his place looked so really rocky, like it was not going to be fertile at all. But ultimately, that's not so, my friends. So the people, listen to this, the people in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were extremely, extremely wicked. Well, that's what we read, isn't it? That the Bible tells us that in verse 13. The people were extremely uh, wicked. In fact, the people of these cities only thought of themselves and satisfying their own evil desires, their own greed, their own lusts, their own needs. And obviously... Uh, um, they didn't care about what God thought about their sinful ways. They were debauched. He saw how they, uh, uh, you know, God saw how they were living, but and they didn't care. 
They didn't care if anyone came and told them about God. They didn't care. They, they, they were living for themselves. They were living for, to satisfy their own lustful ways. And yet God, their creator, they, uh, uh, um, they, he knows very well. He knew very well how they were living. He knows how you and I are living, my friends. So, however, instead of acknowledging God, they were allowing Satan to control them. And so we see that Abram, well, you know, he, he lived in Ur for a total of 70 years. And then he accompanied his father, as we said, and the entire family to Aran, his older brother Aran. We see that the father uh, 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 of Lot had died. And we see all these things happening and the, the life keeps unfolding. But Abram never gives up. We see that just before the migration takes place, after uh, uh, living in a city, we see that uh, uh, five years uh, uh, later, we see that Tara dies at the age of 205 years old, okay? Soon after, Ab uh, God tells Abram to actually uh, go off with his family to the promised land. So here we see again that God knows about everyone, and God knew about the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, and what does he know about the people today? Everything. He knows everything. He knows you and I. He knows every year on our heads, the word tells us. He knows you better than you know yourself, my friend. So, um, in fact, before you make a choice, before you move, before you do anything, God already knows what you're going to do. So, choices here we see that are very, very important, and that's where we come into, because uh, uh, even though many people today may choose to reject God, follow their own ways, they rightfully still belong to him um, because he's their creator, okay? So choices are very important. And so what is my, 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 my thought today? Well, let's make the right choices in life. However, did they make the right choices? Did Lot make the right choices? Because above all, making the right choices is actually choosing God and his perfect ways and his perfect will for your life and my life, before we even make any other choices in life. Why? Because, my friend, you and I might fail. The economy, what's happening to the economy right now? What's happening to all those people with lots of money? That, too, can fail and might fail and will fail. But God never fails. Why? Because he is the great I am. So, my friends, to end off this lesson today, which we then will go into lesson 16 about how God renews his promises to, to Abram, which is very exciting because we see that Abram now is stationed at this rocky, mountainous hills of Canaan. And we see Lot thriving over there on the other side near the lovely, lush, flowing rivers. But we see that in accordance to God's will, Abram still, you know, trusts in God. And we see that in time he obtained, he had obtained much gold and silver and all these things. But even then, that didn't mean anything to him. When he eventually reached Egypt from Iran uh, uh, and the famine overtook the country, etc., we'll see, we see how God then leads him. And, and, you know, and then we see how actually God re he returns to Canaan. But during this long journey and all these long journeys, my friend, which we'll touch on again, he has never forgotten God. During these long journeys, never forgotten God. However, we see that Lot, the son of Abram's younger brother, traveled with Lot, uh, with, with Abram, and also with his livestock and his servants, but made choices following his own needs and desires, his own financial benefits and blessings. And Abram is waiting on God. So for the next lesson, my friends, I know I'll, te I'll tell you the word as a story, but for the next lessons, we will see that as we continue, that there is God's eternal plan, and this plan will never fail, will never fail. So friends, I trust today that you are encouraged that making the right choices is the most important thing in life. But how do we make the right choices? We make them with God. We make them with listening to the voice of God. We make the right choices by obeying God, by listening to his word, and by choosing to do the right thing, even when to mankind and all those around us, it looks like it's wrong. So friends, I pray that today truly reminds them of Sandy, our friend, that says, friends, make the right choices. God bless you. God bless your household. God bless you and your mothers and your fathers. God bless you, mothers and fathers. 
children, friends, God bless you today. I pray a blessing of God's beautiful, loving presence that would overwhelm you and surround you in whatever you do, whatever choices you're making today. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you will know his love, that you will know his, 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 his comfort, that you will know his direction, you will know his provision, because God, Jehovah Jireh, he is the great I am, and he is our provider. He is El Elohim, he is the creator, he is El Shaddai, the ever blessed one, the one that is more than enough, the one that is ever present, El Shama. He is God Almighty. And I trust that today, that he will comfort you and hold you close to his bosom. And when he has done that, he takes you and he puts you in his quiver. And from there, you find your place, tightly woven, tightly engrafted into his love hair. Bless you, precious people. I love you and God bless. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen.